Hello again. Just a really, really quick extra add-on to our design fiction two-part lecture here. Um, I know many of you will be sitting by experience now thinking, okay, design fiction is rather interesting. I can see that it is um, also relevant, but it's really, really hard to know how to get started doing this. Should we just start making videos? Should we wait for tomorrow and actually just make some videos? Uh, how do we plan them? Should we just make a storyboard? Um, what do we do? So I have one more quick method here um, for you, a quick and dirty method, so to speak, that I have found useful for other students before. And it basically is one that elaborates on uh, James Auger's uh, framing here that we talked about in the previous video. The one where we try, try to frame out on the axis of these um, possible scenarios where we basically can begin to say, okay, the probable, the plausible, and the possible, should we maybe explore all of them and maybe also try to look into these alternative and lost futures. So that might, of course, be one way for you to look at your uh, planning process here. Should you try to make uh, one sketch in each of these domains? Um and while I think that's a good idea, I think it's especially a good idea to not just stay in the probable and preferable uh, scenarios, but also go out into the at least the plausible, but also maybe out at a bit farther scope into the plausible, uh, possible domain. I have a tool that can sort of make it a bit more um, close to what we already do as designers when we work with post-it notes and try to make our affinity diagrams and stuff like that. And that is a method that I developed a couple of uh, years ago, but first this year I really have formalized into a framework that I call the design fiction matrix. And that is basically another diagram here where you have the past and you have the future. And then you have the fact and you have fiction on the vertical axis. And what this one gives us basically is that up in the past fact, that is where we have, I call the section histories, but you could also just call it lessons learned. So that is basically where we have all past experience of facts within this domain. So that is, okay, inside one um, context you might be working, that is the previous state of the art, previous kinds of services that has existed in this domain, examples of that. But it's also experiences with those services, experiences within that domain. So it's also reports of uh, problems that have been. It is also uh, user stories about, the use. it could be user reviews, it could be uh, legislation that has been passed that has made it hard for this domain to actually uh, come to fruition to, uh, earlier. Basically everything that has happened before. That is our histories. That is stuff that you probably already have begun to map out of your semester project. So we can begin to put post-its up here and basically map this. If we stay in the past, but then go in to say, okay, sometimes in the past, there are also things that are not exactly fact-based, but more are more fictional-based. We could call it myths, or this day and age, we would probably call it fake news. Um, but that is basically the domain where we look at what kind of preconceptions or misinterpretations or mis uh, misconceptions are there inside this field. That's why I say here there be dragons. It is the myths of the domain. So that might be that one thing is that there is previous cases, there is previous uh, state of the art, previous experiences. But what kind of stuff exists within the your design domain that is plain simply wrong. Things that people just believe, but which is not rooted in any real practice, or what are the sort of the conceptions that are holding people back? Are there some old conventions that people are taking for granted without really questioning them? That could also be the preconceptions or the myths here. So that's also probably stuff that you already should have in your design project things that are paradoxes, things that are weird. But the important fact is, it's things that you can point to and say, this actually has happened. Someone has actually said that, or actually done that, or actually written this in some kind of context. So thus we have our past in both a fact and fiction 
sort of way. If we move up into the future quadrant, but up in the future fact quadrant, that is where we have what I call the, the signals, basically. And that is basically a way of saying, okay, are there things inside of our design domain that we can talk about with a certain probability? And a certain probability points to data. Do we have statistical data? Do we have probabilities because we can see that legislation has been passed that will make it uh, legal to do something? Or has there been made a um, charter saying that something ought to be done about this? Or is there true statistical data that points in some direction? Uh, that might be data about user growth in a domain. It might be economical data about uh, investments in an area. But it might, might also so be demographical. How many uh, are expected to live in a city in the scope of the next 10 years and how will that affect our design context? But it can also be true probabilities. You have all seen now with the coronavirus, the flatten the curve model. That is also a signal, a probability of fact future. We say, okay, there is a certain probability that this will happen and thus we can design around that a situation that has not occurred yet will probably go out in one or two ways. But it's still fact-based, and that's the important part. It is data-based. And then also in the future quadrant, we have the future fiction. And that is where I argue that our design fiction scenarios lie, our speculation. That is where we ask what-if questions. It is basically actually where all design always resides. All design is basically a fiction up until that it is realized. But when we work with it as scenarios, it just makes much more sense because it is the stories of the future that we tell ourselves, even though that we don't have clear signals yet that it will be like that. But in this domain, we argue that it might be. And that's the important difference here. This is what might be. And where we begin to sort of say, okay, in this domain, it should be like that we point from all the other quadrants and say, okay, how do these inform or support the argument for the design fictions, for the scenarios of the diegetic prototypes and how they will play out? How will we use the past histories, the lessons learned, the state of the art? How will we use the misconceptions or preconceptions that we think are paradoxical for our field? And how will we use the signals, the probabilities of what points towards the future to actually prove that this scenario is not just interesting, it might also be possible, plausible, or even probable. So that's sort of the basic of this design fiction matrix. It is a way to use what you already have or what you can at least go out and find already and sort of use that to inspire and to use it as sort of hooks to put your scenarios up on, to make them possible, plausible, and probable. Um, in the short slide deck that I've added here, I've added a rather rudimentary but true um, case where we worked with Alpo Su, Alpo Solo's KO, um, and we had empirical data. We had uh, Su directors talking with us about their experiences with teenagers in the Su, how they were hard to engage and uh, how the zoo was highly dependent on the weather and the season, and how they had have passed unsuccessful um, reach of their guests through mobile ad technology and apps. And there were many more insights. This is just an example. And then on the signal page, we knew by the public funding that the funding for the zoo was limited in the next five years. We knew that that meant in their own uh, sort of economical model that they had no room for hiring new staff and that by 2020, now this uh, project we did here was five years ago, then 90% of all guests would be using kinds of digital media doing a visit, maybe not just for the visit. So that was a prognosis made by Danish Experience Economy uh, Association. And then some of the myths was that the that many of the zookeepers had this conception that teenagers don't want to visit the zoo with their families. And that's the problem. We have to change their behavior because they don't want to visit zoos anymore. And um, some of the other people 
working at the zoo also had this prayer conception that digital technology should, would disturb the physical experience of the zoo. And the zoo director had this misconception or preconception that only more staff would enable more involving experiences for the visitors. Of course, because that he was very, very, very um, irritated over that they wouldn't have economy for actually hiring more staff. So again, these things are not proven. It's, it, it is just opinions. It's opinionated things. And it's things that we thought were paradoxical because they had no evidence for that. It was just things that they had opinions about. So in our words, it would be sort of misconceptions or possible misconceptions. At least it would be myths. And that sort of informed our way of beginning to create these what-if questions. What if teenagers became responsible for the zoo? How could we do, how could create, we create scenarios where they would do that? Could we sort of turn the power balance? What if we could challenge the families in a flexible adventure, combining physical and digital, sort of using the digital not as a thing on its own, but just as a tool to actually uh, make the physical aspects of the zoo more engaging? Again, a, an empowerment of the guests. And... Um, then we also made a possible scenario, because there is a lot of debate about zoos in the world, especially larger animals and simian animals. What if there were no real animals in the zoo in the future? How would we then cope with zoological experiences? And that was one of many uh, of these scenarios that we began to develop. Just to show you how this can be rooted up again and far and used as sort of arguments uh, for each other in these quadrants here. And I have here some examples, students from the past years of, um, of this workshop that we can look at. Some, uh, sometimes they've used a whiteboard with post-its and then it looks a lot like we usually already do when we do design thinking. Others has mapped it out digitally in their exam papers, for an example. Um, and there we are, basically. A, um, a rather simple tool, and uh, you don't have to use it, but uh, now the, the tool has been given to you, and you can see if it makes sense for your group works and analysis. It also depends on where you are. Do you have data? Or maybe if you say, oh, well, we don't really have any signals for the future. We don't have any probabilities or any data in our projects that point that way. Then maybe that's something that you will spend the afternoon here looking into because the more you have in the histories the signals and the myths the easier it will be to say okay we have to address this and this and this in our scenarios and it becomes much easier to actually think about these possibilities plausibilities probabilities in design fiction scenarios and as you can see here on your moodle page i have actually way down below Way down. After all of the references, um, I have actually I've made a printer a friendly version here of the uh, the matrix you can download, and I have also made a short assignment. And those of you who think okay, this design fiction matrix might sound beneficial, you can try to go through these four steps in uh, the afternoon here, where I basically say what I've just told in the introduction here, map out your problem space in the uh, design fiction matrix, the histories, the myths, the signals, and of course then move on to point two, begin to discuss these what-if scenarios, what could exist and how is this possible if you look at it from the user point of view, state the ideas as actually asking these what-if scenarios. And try to make three to five of these scenarios with different ideas. Try to think both about the front end, the user side, but also the back end, the organizational side of the service concept in terms of this what if and how it will address these things you have mapped out in the matrix. And um, then also try to use James Aukers, the original model there with the past and present and all of these um, technology emergences. Try to assess in that model how speculative is it? How um, close to the present, the near future, or the far future are you? So basically use the design fiction matrix, the auger, 
And of course, in the end, what you're basically asking questions about is in what part of the future cone are you actually in the project? So, thanks again for allowing me these 14 minutes of your time. And um, get cracking. <laughs>